You're the winners. You've uh, you stuck it out. Uh, you stuck it out for the whole uh, the whole day. Thank you very much. And uh, this last one is, of course, very worth it because it's lots of fun uh, talking about drones. And for those of you who stick around afterward, there'll be drone flying demonstrations in this room. Um, so Matt Waite is the head of our drone journalism lab here at UNL, and he will be talking to you about uh, all the latest that they've been doing and, and learning. Thanks, Matt. Good so, um, I have no volume control, so you're going to probably be deafened by me. Sorry about that. Um, show of hands in the room. Who would like to go to federal prison today? Come on, don't be shy. There we go. Got one. Brave soul. Leavenworth's beautiful this time of year. Um, right now, uh, because we had a uh, we had a, a small. Uh, sporting contest here on campus today. I don't know if you all who are not from here know that uh, we have a small time college football program here. A few of us gather on Saturday mornings uh, to cheer on the lads. Um, not a lot of people go. It's kind of it's kind of kind of a small thing. Um, but in the United States, around college football stadiums that have more than 30,000 people in them, Division I college football stadiums that have more than 30,000 people in them, there's a three mile uh, flight restriction around them. And flying into that flight restriction uh, is a federal crime punishable by up to a year in federal prison. So uh, I had fully planned on it being a beautiful day today and us going outside after this and flying drones around um, on campus. Uh, and you could see some of the, the remainder of the fall foliage here. Uh, but a couple months back, uh, God decided we didn't want to have our first football game, and they rescheduled this one today, so we're kind of stuck. So we'll be flying little ones in here. If you want to hang out, uh, I'll show you how to fly them. But what I want to talk about now is more about how we're, how we're using them and how we can be using them, particularly uh, in context of, of mobile. So something we're seeing a lot of these days are photographs and video like this. This is from Mexico Beach, Florida, after the hurricane that went through there. Um, truly breathtaking images, but the video, I think, is even more interesting because NBC just took the video feed straight from a, uh, a third party, a, uh, a company, and just put it out on the internet and all they really did was annotate it a little bit with some information but you can see the pilot making course adjustments that's truly amazing just in an entire house that's been shifted into the middle of the road but you'll see them flying along you'll see the pilot go that little pan down there, it's because you see those two military vehicles. Uh, I'm not going to go over them. So it hangs a left here and flies down this canal. This video goes on, I want to say, for two, two minutes, which in online video land is, is pretty long. And I've seen some of these drone videos go on for five, six minutes. Um, yesterday, I was at an event uh, at, um, at CUNY in New York. Uh, talking with a, a lot of uh, lawyers and senior managers in newsrooms that deal with drones. And Greg Agvent of CNN, who runs their drone unit, said they have metrics that show that they can throw up a six-minute long drone video and people will watch it and watch it in greater numbers than some of their highly produced video. So they've gotten to the point that in these major disasters, as soon as they have reasonably useful raw drone video, they just throw it up. They don't, even, they don't even take the time to edit it down, throw in a stand-up, have a journalist talk over it. They just throw the video up. And the metrics show that it, it gets views. It gets a lot of views. And you can see why. It's, it's impossible as a writer to go to a place like Mexico Beach, Florida, and describe what you're seeing in any reasonable amount of time. 
And I say that as somebody who spent, uh, who spent 10 years in Florida and covered five hurricanes, when you get there, everything's just blown over and blown up and there's piles of, of debris everywhere. And you, you don't know where to start, you don't know where to go. And it's really, really hard to describe to people how big and how far and how wide this goes. For those of you who've never been through a hurricane, hurricane force winds can extend up to 80 miles from the center of the storm. A hurricane itself can be 400 miles wide from both sides. Those native to the great state of Nebraska, how wide is Nebraska at its widest point? A little trivia, 410 miles. So imagine a storm that stretches from the, all the way out to the border of Wyoming to the Missouri River. We're talking about an enormous weather system that can do an enormous amount of damage over an enormous period or an, over, an enormous space. So being able to get into the air and seeing it, even from just this, which is only you know maybe 80 feet, maybe 100 feet tops, is extraordinarily advantageous. So where we've gone in the last 10 years is we've gone from people building these out of kits. You could buy the parts off the internet and you could build it yourself. And in fact, at the drone lab, that's exactly what we did immediately. If you ever want to have a ton of fun with your university administration, buy a bunch of parts from really obscure Chinese manufacturers on your university credit card. You can hear the alarm bells from blocks away. It's fabulous fun. So that's what we did originally. We built, we built our own drones out of kits. They were terrible. They, they crashed. They were, they were unstable. They were frankly dangerous. Um, and now we've got off the shelf systems you can buy off Amazon. You can drive to the Best Buy out here on O Street and buy one and walk out of there, charge the battery up and go fly. And, and you've, got a, uh, you've got a platform that can fly for about 20 to 25 minutes, shoot 4K cinematic quality video. Uh, and you probably spent maybe $1,200 maybe less, maybe more, depending. Um, and I don't, I say this again, not to sound like a used car salesman, but I can find a drone that fits your budget. There's a great drone that's uh, called the Mavic 2. It'll run you about 800 bucks, about a grand if you had some batteries and, and some backup material. Um, shoots that kind of video. Or if you got money, you can go up to the $10,000 Inspire 2 with all the, all the fixings. If you want to go even further than that, you can get into the half a million dollar miniaturized gas powered helicopters that can carry $300,000 Cineflex cameras. They can chase uh, Indy cars around, uh, around racetracks and, and shoot it like an amazing, you know, Jerry Bruckheimer movie or something like that. So everything in between there is possible. It just no matter what your budget is. So we've got the ability now to have cinematic aerials wherever you go. Um, and you don't have to have an enormous budget. It's not all good news. I don't want to make this sound like everything's great. Um, everywhere around the world, everywhere. Now the civil aviation authorities in those countries have put rules into place. Some of them are better than others. Um, if you had talked to me about this five years ago, I would have told you that the United States is an absolute hellscape backwater and we should all flee with our lives if you're trying to fly drones. And I would have only been slightly exaggerating. Now, the U.S. is actually fairly reasonable compared to a lot of places in the world. Um, the general set of rules everywhere is you generally have to be about 16 to fly a drone professionally. There are some students in the room I'm a little doubtful of, but the rest of us have pretty much left that in the rearview mirror. Um, you have to be able to speak the local language, which is unfortunate because I am well and truly American and I don't talk American good, so I don't speak other languages at all. Um, where, I, where I encountered this the first time was actually in Chile. I went down there to do some work with a university and I read Chile's drone rules in Spanish and was able to follow along because the, the words are very, very similar. I, took Spanish in college, so I remembered some of it. Um, but I was like, oh, I should just get me a Chilean professional drone license. And the Chilean Civil Aviation Authority is at the Santiago airport. Like I was going through there. All I had to do was walk out of the international terminal, walk over to their office, take the test. They gave it to me and I was reading it and said, you had to be 16. I'm like, cool. 
You have to be uh, well enough to be able to conduct the flight safely, meaning you can't be you know, sick or blind or anything like that. All right, I'm good there. And you have to be able to read, write, and understand the Spanish language. And then my immediate question was, how well? Because donde esta la biblioteca is probably not useful um, with drone work. But it's that same way in, in Italy, it's the same way in Germany, same way in France. What separates most of the rest of the Western world from the United States is in those countries, you actually have to demonstrate flight capability. You will have to go to a Civil Aviation Authority office. You will have to pull your drone out. You'll have to fly it around the parking lot and show that you're not a complete idiot and you can fly it. In the United States, the only thing that you have to do is pass a knowledge test. If you can get a 70% 70 70 score on a 60 question multiple choice test, you too can be a professional drone pilot in the United States. It is a lot of specialized material. I don't want to make, I don't want to undersell it here. It is, it is reasonably difficult to pass the first time, but if you can study, you can do it. Um, you do not have to actually fly and demonstrate to the FAA that you can do it. Essentially, the FAA is saying, we don't care if you crash your drone. We just want to know that you realize that you're responsible for it if you do. Um, so it's reasonably, easy to get a professional drone license in the United States. It's less easy to actually operate precisely because of what we talked about here today. If we wanted to go outside right now, one, we're in a, in a temporary restriction zone. We're in national defense airspace, which was actually put in place after 9-11 around a uh, large stadium. So if we were near an MLB stadium or an NFL stadium or college football or a NASCAR event uh, and it were going on, we, we'd be running into that. We're also about two and a half miles from the end of the runway at Lincoln Municipal Airport, uh, which puts us in controlled airspace. So even if there wasn't a game going on right now, we would have to call the tower and let them know where we're at. Lincoln is one of the first cities in the United States to get an automated system for this. So we can actually pull out our smartphones and request airspace through a system called Lance, which is fabulous. Um, you probably didn't know you were in drone paradise, but you are. Um, we're also on a university campus. The FAA controls the airspace, and this is, what I this is what I tell my students all the time. The FAA controls the airspace. When you launch your drone, your drone is immediately in federally regulated airspace. Your ass, however, is in somebody's jurisdiction. And in this case, you're on the university's campus. So takeoff and landing at the university with a drone is tightly regulated by the university. Um, I have to call university police every time I fly on campus and let them know where I'm at, who I am, where I'm at, what I'm going to do, and how long I'm going to do it. Um, they never say no, they just write my name down and, and move on with life. But um, the university is very concerned for a liability purpose. If we went outside with a flying lawnmower with 30,000 of my favorite people on the earth because they wear red and they cheer for Nebraska, we'd be putting them at risk. There's no question. That many people around with, with, a, with a drone and you have, you have safety issues to deal with. So there's a lot going on here. There's a lot you have to understand if you're gonna be a drone pilot. It's not just the United States, it's the world over. There are all kinds of cultural, uh, uh, cultural sensitivities that you have to deal with. There's different laws, there's all manner of different things. What doesn't help is that with the profusion of this technology, we have a profusion of bad actors. We have people who run out to Best Buy and throw down a bunch of money and buy a drone and think that they can do whatever the heck they want, wherever the heck they want. And they don't do the barest amount of due diligence to figure out uh, what the rules are and how to follow them. That has had a negative impact in a lot of countries. Um, the United States has been extraordinarily slow to change their rules precisely because of this. In Canada, Canada went from one of the best places on the planet to be a drone operator. So good, in fact, that Amazon took their delivery drone testing operation and moved it across the border into Canada, literally with an eyesight of the US border. You could see it from their office. That's how far inside Canada they moved it because Canadian regulators were like, yeah, you wanna do that out in your rural giant piece of land that you got? Go ahead, we don't care. We don't care. And the FAA was putting them through years worth of paperwork. So they just got up and moved across the border. Canada then appointed a uh, civil aviation uh, administrator who was a former pilot and who absolutely was terrified of a drone airplane collision. And he shut it all down. Almost overnight, Canada passed new rules that got rid of all of it. And Amazon came crawling back. 
in the United Kingdom, uh, they, became, they came perilously close to passing rules that would have shut down drone operations there when a uh, pilot on approach to Heathrow said his plane hit a, hit a drone. Now, I want you to have a good idea of this. If you're a jet, if you're a jet pilot, you have a series of windows that are about this big to look out. You're going 250 miles an hour and until you're on the ground, you're, you know, you're coming in pretty steep. So you're, you're thousands of feet up. So at 3000 feet and at 250 miles an hour, this pilot said a drone hit his aircraft. Nope. Actually it was a plastic bag. It had caught the wind. It had floated up. The airplane hit it. It did not actually leave a visible mark on the airplane. If you're wondering. Um, and thankfully the, Civil Aviation Authority in the United Kingdom said, all right, everybody, calm down. Um, I argue all the time, and I talk with students about this when they take classes with me to get their drone license, that journalists have the obligation to be first-rate users of the airspace. The reason for that is, A, we are an industry that has standards for professional conduct. We have ethics policies. We have expectations uh, that are generally understood in newsrooms. Number two, our default standpoint is public. There is no business purpose for us to go out and shoot a bunch of video and then keep it to ourselves. We're doing this to inform the public, which means the public is going to see what we do. And if that's the case, we better be doing it right or the marketplace is going to react to us. So. I do not want journalists to be the reason that civil aviation authorities anywhere shut down airspace or restrict operations like this. It doesn't take a great leap of imagination to understand why a flying camera would be useful. It really doesn't. You can, this drone makes the camera the most flexible boom arm that you've ever seen in your life. You can put it anywhere you want. You can do pretty much anything you want with it. What we really haven't done yet is push the boundaries very far. But I wanted to show you something that I just found today. Two things. One, you saw the previous hurricane footage. This is not CNN Air doing this. This is a private operator, maybe. There we go. That they took called wxchasing.com. Don't do this. Because you got banners hanging down from the roof, even the pilot sees it, it's like, oh, I gotta get down. There's gonna be a jump cut here, right about there. Because guess what happened? <laughs> Now watch this. This takes a tremendous amount of stupidity to try this twice. <laughs> but watch. It's a, don't get me wrong, it's a breathtaking shot, but man alive, you had better be on your game here. Okay, gets underneath the basketball hoop, gets over the volleyball net, but gets a little scared and is looking around like, where am I going? What am I doing? And boop. <laughs> don't do that. When I talk about pushing the boundaries, that's not what I mean. What I mean is something more like this, which is a, um, a company uh, called Gravity Research. I think it's yeah, Gravity Research Associates. They're looking at using first-person view racing drones to cover extreme sports. And my goodness, do you have to be a good pilot to pull this off? These FPV drones are tiny and very, very nimble and they can do right about 100 miles an hour. They are not the big ones that we're accustomed to using, but you can do a lot with them. And this is an area we really have not explored very much. Mostly because I'm thinking like a parent and thinking to that guy, what are you doing? You're gonna hurt yourself. <laughs> 
I will burn in hell before I show my son this, by the way. <laughs> That's from a drone. He's going backwards. He can't see where he's going. That's pretty amazing to me. But it doesn't take extreme actions to do this. We did it here on campus uh, just this past December. Those of you who are not familiar, that's Cather and Pound Halls. They were uh, dorms built in the 1950s. They had outlived their useful life. In fact, they were becoming structurally dangerous to have around. And so the university decided uh, we should blow them up real good. We went through months of meetings with an absolutely breathtaking number of lawyers to be able to bring you this shot. Um, we were the only drone operators allowed to be on campus and over campus. Uh, and what was fun about this was it's 15 degrees outside. Cold affects batteries pretty substantially, so you want to keep them warm. So we were inside of a building, an academic building on campus, until it was time to go out and, and do this. And it was all rigidly timed. We got outside, got our drones out, we we're about to take off, and the FAA came up and said, hold on, before you take off, we need to see your documents. We need to see that you've got licenses and that you're registered and that you have airspace permission to be here. And the five minute alarm goes off. Like, we're like, yo, can we do this later, please? Um, but we pretty much just took our wallets out and threw them at them. Uh, and they're taking our names down. And then some Yahoo uh, local with his drone goes zipping right by. And they handed all our stuff back. And they said, we'll be right back. <laughs> we're like, yeah, go get them. So by the time I'm doing this shot right here, my fingers are frozen. Like I can, I'm, I'm flying with two claws. Like I'm a T-Rex flying a drone, just kind of going like this, because I can't bend my fingers anymore. This is fairly standard video news storytelling. This gives you a view of a major implosion here on campus. But we also did this with a 360 drone, where we mounted a 360 camera on it. That's actually the drone I'm flying right up there in the top corner. Um, of the video that you saw prior, and um, yeah, you can't hear the sound. It's not worth it. It's just a buzzing, and then you're going to hear some booms, and then goodbye buildings. But this is a 360 camera, so if you're afraid of heights, this is probably not your bag. Um, there's several hundred people on this parking garage over here watching it. We are actually right here. This is where we were, we were flying. And if you want to look at how pretty the skyline is while the dust settles over here, you certainly can. So this was one way to take a little bit of a deeper step. I think we probably should have pushed a little harder to get a little closer. This is the Mavic uh, and two Kodak SP360 cameras, one on the bottom, one on the top. I probably should have just told him to fly it right up close to it. If we lose the drone, who cares? Um, that would have been a really neat shot to be really close. But this gives you a different perspective on it using uh, the Power 360. This really didn't take us that much longer than the other video did. We shot the other video in 4K, so the rendering time on it and try to get it all saved out and pushed out to the cloud where we could give it away it was about the same amount of time it took us to render this and then do some sort of um, stabilization on it, which we didn't do a ton of because we wanted to get it out quickly, so it does wobble just a little bit there. Um, but because this was a, a big event on campus, we weren't content with just a couple of cameras here. We wanted to push it even a little bit further. And so we started working with a group over in mechanical engineering. And what they had done was using a process called photogrammetry had actually turned these buildings into three-dimensional models where you can look at everything going on here in this model. This is the pre-version. And then down here is the post. So there's the big pile of rubble. And it's, other than trees, it really struggles with trees. You can kind of see this blurry business over here. 
everything else is pretty photorealistic and down to a truly mind-boggling amount of detail. Um, in some places, you can get about two centimeter level accuracy with it. Like you can identify objects larger than two cents, slightly larger than two centimeters. Um, this photogrammetry work can be used in multiple places. Uh, let me see here. We can begin to take those models and use them in augmented reality and use them in virtual reality. And I think the future of drones is not just using them for pretty pictures or context photos of disasters. It's in this idea of using place as an essential storytelling technique, as using location and experience as essential storytelling techniques, being able to use drones to take you to a place and have you be there as if you were there um, and try to give you that experience. So if you had never seen Cather and Pound Halls and we put the pre-version into virtual reality, you could put an Oculus Rift headset on it and walk past it as if the buildings were still there. And then we can bring them down. One of the really cool things that the engineers did, um, Professor Ricky Wood here on campus, he's the one who, who led this, this project. They actually wired those buildings up with a lot. I'm trying to remember the number. Let's just say it was a really, really, really large number of accelerometers. The same thing that's in your phone that help you play video games when you want to turn and go around like this. Um, they put up lots of really, really expensive, very, very accurate accelerometers all over that building and then blew it up. The, amount, the number of accelerometers and the cost of those accelerometers exceeds the College of Journalism's technology budget for a year. They do things differently in the engineering school, um, but they have hyper-accurate data on exactly how that building fell and have now built mathematical models where they can blow that building up a hundred different ways in software. And it's really, really cool. Um, unfortunately, there are a lot of three-letter agencies in the government that are really, really interested in that data, so I can't actually show it to you. Um, but it's, I've seen it. It's super cool. <laughs> it's really amazingly cool. This idea of using place, though, I want to show an example that a student did here. Uh, her name is America Andrade. She just graduated, uh, which of course means she's dead to me, but I still, I still like the work that she did. Forget her. Um, group of students went to Puerto Rico this last December and uh, were working on stories about uh, Hurricane Maria recovery there. She went to an island called Vieques and did a multimedia story there, including this multimedia piece, this video piece that uh, I'm not going to show all of it, but I just want to show a couple minutes here. The story is about the people who live in this house that are coming up here. And you can see this is a drone shot that she shot right away. She got a Part 107 in a class of mine. Uh, she learned how to fly, handed her the drone, said Puerto Rico is the same law as we do. Go ahead. So the folks that lived in this house um, we're in it during the storm and it's fairly typical of houses in Puerto Rico and it's made of concrete block like you could have shelled it from offshore and it would probably been okay um, but the windows were made of aluminum and single pane glass so when the winds hit you know 130 140 miles an hour the glass came in and then the storm came in the in the, in the house and you can see what happened the story is about how that family is recovering and that uses a bunch of different storytelling techniques but that house plays a role in it after she got done flying over and getting the video story that she wanted to do um, and actually that shot this is another useful uh, useful tool with drones um, the shot from the kitchen not that one uh, go on. There it is. Looks like a steady cam shot, right? She's actually holding the drone in her hand. It's not flying. She's just holding it in her hand because it works as a really great steady cam. Um, 
so the drones were used to sort of augment this video story, but what she also did afterwards was she used an app called Drone Deploy, which automates flights over objects and then used ground-based cameras and was able to build this three-dimensional model of the house that you can, you can zoom right up on it and be right up on the porch and see all kinds of detail. The same shot that we just saw outside of the house where you're looking at the front door, there it is in this three-dimensional model. She then took all of this and taught herself enough unity that she built a virtual reality experience out of it. Um, the last I saw, the build was broken, so I can't actually show you the virtual reality experience, but what you could do was you could actually walk up this road next to the house, turn your head, look all around, and see it. On this fence over here, what she did was she hung a video screen in virtual reality, and it was presence aware, so when you walked up the block, it started playing a video, and it was the homeowner talking about what it was like to be in the house and what the house was like before the storm. She also did a version that didn't work quite as well from inside this room right here. Using the same techniques and photographing the room inside, she built the kitchen and the living room in virtual reality. And you can sit in the living room and on the wall is a video screen and you can watch that same video that we just watched where the young lady was sitting in the rocking chair. And then you look to the right and there's the rocking chair. You're in the same room she was in when she did that interview, and it feels weirdly real. And I think that's the important part of this, is that it becomes much more real when you can actually stand there and turn your head and look around, and there's voices coming in, and you feel a lot more empathy for the person. But it's not just virtual reality that we can do this in, and I'm going to run with scissors just a touch here. And I hope this works. And the survey says, aha. So, this is that same house. This is a website called Sketchfab that um, is essentially a, a site for three-dimensional models. But their iPhone app, maybe, upside down, there we go, has an augmented reality layer that you can put into, and it will turn those models into augmented reality. And hopefully this works. Oh, very nice. So now I have this house. There you go. We'll look out into infinity in the screen there. But I have this house, and if I wasn't tethered by this very, very short VGA cord, uh, we could walk around the house, view it in any way we wanted to, and treat it as an object in, in real space. and walk around underneath the house, look at the debris all around it, climb up on the stairs and go up on the deck and walk all around. You can do this in Unity. You can learn Unity. Um, or Sketchfab does it for free if you want to see what a proof of concept looks like with that. But let's talk about what it takes to do this. And hopefully my screen will pop back. Do, 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 do. There we go. Love it when technology works. So, what do you need to pull this off? How can we take a location and turn it into augmented reality on news deadlines. I'll be honest, that's reasonably tough to do right now. That's pretty substantially tough to do right now, but we're getting closer. The drone side of it is actually pretty easy. What do you need? Well, you need a drone. Um, I don't get paid. Uh, I don't benefit by this, but I recommend DJI gear. Um, it's good stuff. It's a little more costly than a lot of drones that are out there, but the, the quality is, is worth the money. The two that I recommend to most journalists are the DJI Mavic series, uh, which are small, they're very portable, 
Uh, if you're a photographer, you can put one in a camera bag. It's about the same size as one of the lenses in your camera bag. Um, which means if you're a small group and you're going a very long way, you can do a lot of hiking, that is absolutely worth the money right there because you're going to have to carry a bunch of other gear. If you're carrying a ton of other gear, a big clunky hard case shell drone case is just not, not viable. If the, uh, it's very light also, by the way, uh, which is good and bad. Out here on the Great Plains of America, you know, a calm day is 12 to 15 mile an hour winds. Um, that Mavic's gonna get pretty beat up in that wind. Um, the other one I recommend is the Phantom 4 series. Um, the Phantom 4 Pro is what we're up to. It's bigger, so it's less portable, but it also handled more wind, it's, it's much more stable. Um, I can show you another video of a, of a corn harvest where we had a solid 15 mile an hour wind cutting straight across the field the entire day and it shot with a Phantom 4 and you'd have no idea that there was any wind at all. Um, I will say if you do have cash to burn, the Inspire 2 is a fine aircraft. Uh, you can put an extra camera on it, interchangeable lenses. If you put it in sport mode, it tops out at about 88 miles an hour. So if you want to chase cars down the interstate, be my guest. Uh, students of mine are semi-terrified of flying the Inspires because they absolutely abuse the air. Like it is a, it is a monster machine. It's, it's, if you're flying a Mavic, it's like driving a Honda Civic and then suddenly somebody hands you the keys to a Lamborghini. Like it just flies, it just jumps out of your hands. So, um, you need a drone to be able to do this. You need a nap call, like Drone Deploy or Precision Hawk or something like that. I use Drone Deploy, it's very, very simple, it's free. Uh, they make their money because you can upload all of your photos to them and they'll process them into, into these models and maps. Um, but if you just wanna use it to automate the flight, that's great. What you do is you just draw a rectangle around the area you wanna fly, it will automatically program the correct flight path, flight paths to get the correct amount of overlap over everything. If you're gonna be doing three-dimensional modeling, I suggest you do this four times. You do it horizontally, you do it vertically, you do it angled one way, and then you do it angled another way. And you get maximum amount of photo coverage uh, doing that. You need a ground-based camera. Any really decent camera will do. Uh, you want to aim for about 40% overlap. Ideally, that camera will have a GPS chip in it, uh, which will make uh, calibrating the photos to the model much easier. You need software to stitch it together. This, unfortunately, is where the, the cost comes in. Uh, if you have budget, you want PIX4D. PIX4D is... Uh, pretty much recognized as the industry standard for this. The problem is it's extraordinarily expensive. It's 350 bucks a month. You don't buy it, you rent it. So you're looking at roughly four grand a year if you wanna do this. Uh, and that's every year. The other thing that I will tell you about this, and the, uh, by the way, the other piece of software is, um, that um, we're exploring now is called Capturing Reality. You can get a uh, three month license for about 115 bucks. It's 99 euro. Uh, they're not an American company. So that's considerably less, but um, it has its quirks. It has its quirks. So um, the other thing I would warn you is that these renders don't go fast. We have a pretty beefy PC in the building that we run all this stuff on, and the house renders uh, in, in Puerto Rico would take the better part of two and a half days of just constant running. Um, we're currently trying to build a render farm in the college to try to cut that down uh, by distributing all of this work across multiple computers, but I have no idea if that's gonna work or not. So um, the engineering folks, they have a PC that they've spent the better part of $15,000 on to make this run faster and they're really not happy with it. So rendering these models out from the software is not an inexpensive pro uh, a proposition. So once you have done that, once you've shot from the ground and from the air, once you've rendered this out, um, to get it somewhere, really, if you want to do it, you probably ought to learn Unity. That's really not easy. Um, and yes, we're talking about a lot of stuff here. But that's a lot of stuff today. The, the, the sort of jokey way I talk about this is, it's not easy, it's not fast. The audience is not quite there yet. Um, augmented reality way more than virtual reality. So what are we waiting for? Let's, let's just do this. Um, 
the cost, the time, and the effort are going to come down. The pain points are going to get worked out. The more that this happens, the more that we're going to figure this out and we're going to be boiling this down and it's going to get better. Um, but I think now's the time to be experimenting. Now's the time to be doing this and now's the time to be trying this because um, more and more augmented reality applications are coming along. More and more mobile users are becoming accustomed to that type of experience. If we want to capture this for news, now's the time to be learning this stuff. With that, any questions? You all have sat through two days of this. It's the end of this day. Really good, too. Yeah. So I'm not surprised that yeah. you're a little quiet right now. Thinking, thinking, but, thinking. I was pretty stunned by how still some of those shots were, some of the aerial shots. Yep. Um, do you envision a future where drones replace tripods? <laughs> um, the only reason that I don't anticipate that is because you don't need a battery to run a tripod. Um, I, I, will, I will right now reveal exactly how old I am by telling you that the sort of marker that I use for how much drones are going to replace is actually the O.J. Simpson chase, um, where the white Bronco, that Bronco was going slow enough through Los Angeles that you could attract it with a drone, but you can only fly for about 25 minutes and it has to remain within your line of sight. And so you wouldn't have gotten very far nor done very much following that Bronco around with a drone. So, um, yeah, the, the, the gimbals on these drones are, are amazing. And if you've never been in a place after a hurricane has gone through, the air is just, the air is like a boiling pot of water. There's just wind coming from no discernible direction. It's gusty. Um, I can show you, uh, I can show you of all people, CNN video from a helicopter that they got up right away afterward. And it was very clear that they just found a guy with a helicopter and got in the air as fast as possible because they're just sticking a camera out the window. And that camera is shaking. I've been in that helicopter before at Hurricane Ivan. And um, yeah, you're bouncing around. It is turbulent. Uh, if you're afraid of flying, don't ever do that. I was popping Dramamine like they were Skittles for an entire day. Um, I'm not too proud to say that I ended up retching into my overnight bag to not foul the whole helicopter up. It's gross. It's awful. So getting a drone in the air and getting those stabilizers on it, uh, an Inspire would handle that wind no problem, and that that gimbal will just knock that wobble out completely. It looks like it's on a, on a, on a table up there. Until we get to, uh, you know, sort of unlimited battery power, it's there's still no replacement for a tripod or, or even a, a full-blown helicopter. Um, but for those of you who are wondering, um, the economic argument for drones is, like, I can buy the most tricked out Inspire 2 with all the lenses and all of the interchangeable stuff, and I'm spending maybe $12,000. That television news helicopter that uh, you know larger affiliates have is a four million dollar aircraft, and that's just to take it off the lot. That doesn't include the hundreds of thousands of dollars a year you need to employ a pilot to insure it, to fuel it, to house it. Um, if you're somebody like CNN and you're showing up in Mexico, Mexico Beach, Florida, and you find somebody uh, you know in one of the airports nearby with a helicopter, you're dropping about eighteen hundred dollars per hour to fly that thing around. So it doesn't take a lot of helicopter flights before you've paid off that drone easily. Is it a replacement for it? No. Is it most of a replacement for it? Are you going to try really, really hard to replace it because of the cost differences? Absolutely, and particularly if you're a smaller organization. Any other questions? Just ready to go the hell home, huh? <laughs> well, thank you very much for your time and attention. I very much appreciate it. All right, so those who want to stick around for, for uh, a demonstration of flying drones in here, please do. Everybody else, thank you very much for coming. Thanks for your attention. Uh, thanks for sticking it out uh, on this, uh, this football day. And uh, have a great rest of your weekend. We appreciate your being here. By the way, you didn't miss much of a game. So. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
There they are. Yes. Okay. Um, but yep, there you go. Well, this is going to be the loudest demonstration you've ever had in your life. So, um, so this is the parrot mambo. You can get these at Target. It'll run you about eighty bucks. The great thing about the Parrot Mambo is um, it has the same sensors and the same chips on board that the big models do. So what you see here, this little screen looking thing is an ultrasonic sensor and that's sending sound to the ground like sonar and it knows how high off the ground it is then to a certain point, about eight, 10 feet, it starts to lose track of the ground, but then it doesn't really matter. The other thing it has on the bottom here is this little pinhole that's actually a camera, but it's not really a camera. It's, it's an optical flow sensor. So what it's doing is it's taking a picture of the ground every half a second or so, and then it's comparing it to the previous photo, and then it knows if it's moving or not. So when we launch this thing off, it's going to sit there and hover like the most obedient dog you've ever seen in your life. It's not going to go anywhere, and that's the benefit of these. You may have had like a, a, a younger sibling who got one of these for Christmas. Your dad might have bought one, and they're sort of you know, cheapo ones off of, off of the internet. And they're hard to fly because you're sitting there, and you have to keep a constant pressure on the throttle to keep it off the ground. And you're spending as much time figuring out what you're doing with your left hand as you are trying to steer around with your right. I used to try to make students learn how to fly those first. It was impossible. They were just crashing into everything and smashing into walls. This one flies exactly like the big ones. So if you can fly the $80 one, you can fly the $3,000 one. It's, it's really just that simple. So I've got three batteries. Um, so I've got another one over there that we can recharge. So I'm going to show you the basics of flying a quadcopter with this thing indoors. And we're going to take advantage of a little quirk of federal law, which is that the FAA does not have any jurisdiction indoors. <laughs> so I'm going to wait until these two lights stop blinking. And when that happens, I'm connected. All right, everybody, for everybody's safety, walk back over here. Now I will point out, safety with this thing is a relative concept. I can stick my finger in it 
I still have a finger, still there. Did it sting? Yes, it does, but it's not gonna kill you by any stretch of the imagination. So this is just more to keep you from getting stung than injured. So um, that's another reason to fly the little ones around. So who wants to try this first? We'll just go left, we're left to right, my left to right. So, okay, the thing here is, and, and everybody can watch this. There's a bunch of extra buttons on here that do absolutely nothing. The only thing we're gonna worry about is this stick and this stick. On the left stick, on the left side, it does two things, throttle and yaw. So throttle is up and down, yaw is spinning left and right on the horizontal axis. So if you wanna to look to the left, you push to the left on the left stick, you wanna to look to the right, you'll turn to the right on the right stick. The right stick is direction. It's forward, backwards, left, right, but it's all flat. So if you wanna go up, it's on your left stick. If you wanna go forward, it's on your right stick. So that's the, that's the basic flight controls. The other advantage that this thing has over the big ones is that it has automatic takeoff and landing. That button right there will take you off. So if you hit that button, there it goes. Okay, there you go. Give it a little throttle and get up in the air. And now we're, yep, see, left, right. And now just let go of it. See how it stops and it'll just hover. That's the advantage. Like she could set the controller down and walk away and it's gonna stay right there and not go anywhere. Okay, now what I want you to do is I want you to fly right at Steve. <laughs> Keep going, you're not, you're not. It's okay, it does a little crooked. Yep, because you're yawing. Now what you've done, see how you can see the green lights? That's the front of it. So now forward is actually back toward us and backwards is towards the back of the room and you've got to figure out where you're at. So there's, see the green lights? Now you're backwards. The other trick of this is figuring out how far away from things you are. You learn very, very quickly that your depth perception at about 30 feet is toast. But you have no idea how close to something you are. So you just like flying backwards, huh? So before you try to, before you try to land it, just hit the button and it will boink, just dump itself on the ground. So that's actually a pretty decent representation of exactly what it's like. Now we're pretty lucky in here that we have a really small drone and a pretty big room. Um, the guy who was flying in that gym had only about maybe eight feet of clearance anywhere he's going, but he had a drone that was probably about yo big. And there's also wind, and there's a ton of interference from all the metal in that gym, so it was flopping around. So he needed at least three to four feet of clearance, and he was probably nowhere near it, so he had no idea how close he was to it. The only thing he could do was look through the camera and see where he was at. So um, that's good fun. So we're going to turn that around. Why don't you hand it over? And if we have extra time, we can fly until we run out of batteries. So that's the automatic take on the landing, so just go ahead and do that. Okay, now give me a throttle on your left hand to get up a little bit higher. And you'll notice, like, it's not... It's not running away from you. Like you can go ahead and hit it pretty hard and drop it pretty hard. And it's not gonna do anything too terrible. Okay, so now let's use the right stick and just figure out direction control. So we'll go forward. So by the way, right there, how close do you think you are to those people? Do you think you're even with them? Do you think you're closer to us than them? Um, closer to us. No, I mean closer to them than us. Than us? Yeah. There you are. So depth perception is tough. And knowing how close to the back of the room you are is tough. So just bring it down a little bit. Yep. The one thing about that ultrasonic is it's going to see those chairs down there and it's going to try to rise up and get out of the way of them. So go to the back of the room. So that's on the right stick. All right. Keep going. Stop when you think you're really close to the back of the room. All right there. Steve, how close is she to you? So if you like 10 feet. Yeah. No, it feels like right next to it, right? All right, now bring it. Now bring it back. Yeah, now you're two. There you go. Yep, it's trying to get away from those chairs. So, 
You're pretty good and clear from the ceiling, so you're all right. So, you know, one thing we've been doing, let's see, bring it in for a landing. Right there. So, now one thing that you will do when you first start out is you're going to think in 90 degree angles because it's, I want to go up, down, I want to go forward, backward, left, right. Where you get, after you've flown this a while, is you start to get into doing things like orbiting around the room and figure eights and messing with people's heads. And having a little bit more fun with direction control. Continuous motion. Yep. 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 So instead of going like this, and then like this, and then like this. Now, mind you, you will make people sick doing this kind of thing with a camera on. Let's get out of the way. And that's what I was waiting on. See how it's red lights now? Batteries are dying. If the battery dies and it's in the air. On this one, it'll fall right out of the sky. Um, <laughs> with the um, the DJI models, you've got your controller and you've got your phone as a heads-up display, and it will tell you when, what your battery levels are at. We can just kind of guess at this one. Um, you'll have your phone up, battery display on there, and at 30%, it'll sound an alarm. And it wants you to land by 25%. If you try to push it below 25%, get about 22, I think it's 22, 21%, it'll actually kick into a return to home function. When you took, when you take off with those and you unlock the props, it remembers the GPS location of where you've taken off from. So if you're not gonna bring it back by the time the battery runs out, it will bring itself back and land it when before it does that. Um, the good that's a good thing when you're on land and you have a good GPS signal and you're in an open area and you have nothing in the way if you are on the opposite side of a building flying around and return to home kicks in it's gonna fly right into the set of that building because it's not gonna know it's there they're not presence aware at all um, so the other thing is, if you're on a boat, this happened to this happened to a, um, a professional conference student of mine. He went to the drone camp that we did. Gets out on the back of a boat, is flying around. He takes off, and the return to home is fixed, and he thinks it's fixed to the back of the boat. But they're on a boat. Boats move, and he's chasing whales around, uh, and. The alarm starts to go off and he needs to come back. And he actually hits the return to home button, but it goes to return to home where the boat was, not where the boat is. And he was not comfortable landing it on the back of the boat. So he kept hitting, he kept resetting the return to home to where he was. And then he hit the return to home and it kept trying to land. And it eventually ran out of battery and dropped into the ocean and it was gone. So, yeah, it's on, it's on a, um, it's on a micro SD card on the drone. So once it's in the drink, it's gone. So that's your button for automatic takeoff. And then, you ever done this before? A few times, like our small ones, like the thirty dollars ones you hear about. Yep. So this one will fly a lot more stable. So it's not gonna not gonna run away on you, and you don't have to actually feather the throttle to keep it going. So. That depth perception is really weird. Yeah. One other thing, bring it back real quick. I want to show everybody this. So just but like put it over that plate right there and get it up high enough that we're not in the like above head high. You all should come over here real quick. Oh, try to push it back. It's going to try to run away. But put your hand out under here and feel the wind that it kicks off. Like this is a little teeny tiny toy drone. <laughs> yeah, it's trying to. It feels that it, it sees the obstruction underneath. So if you walk underneath it like that, it's going to go, oh, hey. So um, 
it's a little tiny toy drone and it's kicking off a pretty profound amount of air. Um, so when we get the Inspires out and they've got foot long blades on them and they're just chopping the air up. Yeah. You absolutely could. Well, you could lose a finger. Yeah. It's probably not enough to get through your your tibia and fibia here, but I'm not going to find out. Uh, they used to sell metal blades on the on the idea that a thicker, more robust blade would actually push more air, and they did actually remove limbs, and then they stopped selling them. So they're plastic, so it's going to get to your bone and then probably break on the bone. But let's just say I don't want to find out. Yeah. So take a little tool around here a little bit and then bring her back. You feel the wind coming off there, Amy? Yeah. <laughs> and then when you're ready to land it, just hit the landing button and dump it right on the ground here. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's it's sensing something. Now, again, it's a eighty dollar drone, so the sensors are not great. They're not perfect, but um, you know, it's better than nothing. Oh, it's better than that that five dollar one that you've probably flown around. So, yeah, it'll it'll you you have to just sit there that's that's the difference you have to sit there the throttle that you give it is the throttle that's keeping it in the air the sensor on this one actually keeps it going so there you go you done this before get up get up get up get up get up get up there we go and we're at the ceiling. <laughs> wow, that was weird. Okay, is it? Are you doing any of this? No, I'm okay. it's getting weird. Let me. Like I was hitting it down, and it kept going up. Yeah. Let's do something very quickly. I'm gonna just reset it quick. Uh, you know, I don't. I can't say that for certain. It's again, it's an eighty dollar drone, so the the big ones will not do that. Now, the big ones will have problems with other things, like if you're on a piece of concrete that has a ton of rebar in it, the metal will actually interfere with the um, with the compass. They have a magnetic compass in them as a as a guidance system. Okay, there we go. Let's give it a little throttle. And I should be able to fly around. So you get forward, do left and right. These chairs and this odd configuration in here are just that's gonna play around with it a little bit. So you can throttle it down, there you go. And then we'll go back to the left and try to go to the back of the room to where you think you're gonna hit one of these chairs. We'll avoid Steve this time. We're not gonna put him at risk. More to the left, maybe. Should I go up to... Where do you think you're at the back of the room? I think... Oh, it's hard to tell. Yeah, that's precisely the point. Ooh, and blink. You're fine, don't worry about it. You want to just set it on the stairs there? Yeah. Is the green lights facing you? Uh, yeah. Thank you. The reason I keep these around is no. you. Yeah, uh, it's just gonna try to. Come on, I'm gonna try to. And it's just quite late. So the you, green light means that green light is facing forward. Yeah. So, so that, I need. So you want to try to yaw it with this stick. This will turn on your horizontal light. There you oh, go. Oh, gotcha. So yeah. now okay. there are the green lights. Now. So now everything's gonna be backwards. Yeah. So forward is backwards and backwards. Which direction? Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And then. Hit that and it, it can Yep. It should just drop right down. You already don't want to, right. even it drops off the stage, it's not okay. a big deal. <laughs> this one, um, I should point out, to make you a little less nervous, this one belongs to the College Journals of Mass Communications. We can bury it in the walls, it really doesn't matter, we'll get another one. <laughs> this one, on the other hand, this one is my son's. 
So we're using we're using it as a backup right now uh, and a battery charger um, because they charge in the in the device. So uh, yeah, if we wreck this one, I'm not going to be upset. If we wreck that one. I'm not the only one that's going to be upset. <laughs> yeah. And then when I got to go on Amazon and buy another one, uh, my wife's not going to be happy either. So those sensors getting under there and starting to wobble around and push it up and push it around like that, that is one thing you do have to deal with. And it's one thing when I teach students when we go out and do hands-on flying, I want them to learn how to do all of this stuff in auto mode, but I also want them to learn how to do it manually because the day you are out on <laughs> the day you're out on a uh, on a big shoot, the day you're out doing an event that's only going to happen once, that you this is your one shot. That's going to be the day that the government's going to be doing GPS testing, and they're going to shut it off, and you're not going to have GPS. Or you're going to get out there, and there's going to be just tons of metal around, and you're going to have to fly in attitude mode, uh, which means you have to turn off all this other stuff. Um, I am in the university's commercial. If you've seen the Our Grit, Our Glory commercials, um, there's a scene in there where you see a drone flying away from the College of Business. I'm standing there and I'm flying it. The railing in the College of Business's deck is pounded metal wrapped over top of the structure and it absolutely threw the sensors on the Inspire crazy. It just made them nuts. And so, um, I had to fly that whole thing manually. And the way they wanted me to do it was they wanted me to have it hovering right next to there and then they were gonna move this camera through this scene with other students. And then at a certain point, they're gonna say go and the thing was supposed to take off. Well, between the wind and not having any stabilization on it at all, no safety gear at all, it's, it's wandering around, it's flying like this, the sensors are going, I wanna leave here, and I'm like, you gotta stay. And it's also 98 degrees outside when we're doing this, and my pouring down sweat. Uh, we have enough battery for you to fly. <laughs> Go ahead and do it. If you, feel the, if you feel the controller vibrate just slightly, it's going to just give you like one pulse. That means the battery's dying. Just let me know. We'll just dump it and we got one more. So throttle on your left. There you go. And then direction is on your right hand. Uh, biggest one, um, I flew an eight rotor aircraft called an Ascending Technologies Falcon 8. Uh, it's not.